all, but I'm just counting. Yeah. 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 Always got to be the Who's serving today? trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Amen, and let us begin worship.
service off. I want to thank Galen for filling in for me last week when I was out. I'm still very hoarse today, so I'm not going to really lead, lead, you know what I mean? Lead, lead. I think I can kind of get you started. I can facilitate the singing today, but I think you're going to have to help me out, as it should be anyway. So, a very familiar hymn, number 45, Morning Has Broken. Let's all stand and we'll begin worship. Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Now we get to say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Yeah, have you ever tried to speak and nothing comes out? That's kind of what's happening up here. So I am hearing you. That is very good. I do appreciate that, and I hope to hear you more. He is the King of Glory, followed by simply the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. I want to tell you a quick story. Many of you knew in the 90s, a life I try to keep hidden. <laughs> I worked a, a maximum security prison, life without parole. We had a guy one time who had converted to the Muslim faith. And he was a known uh, punisher of Christians. And in the penitentiary, if you are a Christian, it's a very difficult lifestyle. So we find it hard to find the time to come to church. In the penitentiary, the predominant uh, religion is Muslim. And they find it hard as Christians to be a Christian. And I know that sounds hard to believe, but this was in Texas. One day, I walked into the penitentiary through the fifth checkpoint that you went in. And I heard gates slamming. Now, these gates were 20, 25 feet tall, long hallways. And... The guy that was the punisher of Christians, the enforcer, used to make fun of him, used to make fun of Jesus. He'd say, Jesus is a joke. Ah, you believe in Jesus? Well, that day, I noticed he was running down the hallway, and he had a piece of rebar stuck through his back out the front of his body about that far. They were white. You could see a red stain there from his bleeding. And as he ran by, he was being chased by... Uh, a guy that was in the Mexican Mafia who had had enough of him was a Christian Catholic. <laughs> so he took a piece of rebar and stuck it through his entire body. That's not the point I want you to remember. The point I want you to remember is this. As he ran by me, you know what he was saying? Oh, Jesus, don't let me die. Oh, Jesus, please don't let me die. He jumped up onto that gate and climbed up it. Oh, Jesus, help me. Please, Jesus, don't let me die. <laughs> you know what I thought of when I saw it? Well, first I said justice, but that wasn't really what I should have said. I thought about this verse. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. You may not do it on your terms, but it's going to happen. You might as well do it on his terms. That man lived. He came back to the prison. And when I saw him later, I said, you know, I remember you saying something about Jesus. Please don't let me die. And his Muslim parents were like, what did you say? Huh. <laughs> you were calling in the name of Jesus. I tell that story because I'm proud of the fact that I follow Jesus Christ. And this guy secretly follows Jesus. We don't have to be ashamed of being a Christian. There's enough of that in the country anyway. Let's be bold about being Christian. But I promise you, one day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. I just hope it's not like on the terms he had. Because he confessed it and he knew in the end Jesus Christ is Lord and he will be the one to determine our eternal fate. Hymn number, my copy didn't come through, hymn number 336 will be followed by 277. I'll stand you up right before Donna's prayer.
desire that He is Lord over every area of our lives. Um, whether it's on Sunday or Saturday or Monday or whatever, we, would, we desire to have that to be true in our lives. We desire to have fellowship with your Son and what you've called us to. And uh, Lord, be glorified in us. Be glorified in us um, by the way we talk, by the way we live, by, by even what we think. I thank you, God. Uh, we need you. That we know. We pray in Jesus' name. thankful for so many things, but one thing we are extremely thankful for is a little girl that's sitting behind me in the choir right now, Jennabelle. She has been at uh, St. Jude this week and had a up and down time, I would say, with yeah. testing and different things like that. She's dealt with cancer and, and certainly been through many brain surgeries, but from what I understand, the news was good. And we are so thankful for that. You know, I can honestly say that through her events this week, my prayer life has gotten stronger. And I found myself praying more than usual. And I want to continue to do that. <clears throat> Not just for her, I will continue to pray for her, but for others. And it's something that I think God reminded me of. Hey, yeah, here's a need here, but there's a need here. There's a need there. We need to continue to pray more. And I hope that Maybe you'll be challenged to do more as we increase our prayer life. There's nothing better. I just came away from every prayer feeling good. I will text with Jenny Lynn and feel good because this was out of the doctor's hands. This is in God's hands. And you know what? That's where we really want it to be. So I'm so thankful for that. And Don had asked me to say something. I just know that I will text Don and have you heard anything or whatever. Just praise God. That's all we can say. Thank you for being up here. But the choir look even better with those two up there. So I certainly know the, the age of our choir went down dramatically when they walked up here on the platforms. So that was <laughs> certainly, certainly good. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remember, remembrance of me. We simply just say all followers of Christ have a place at this table.
again for this opportunity to come into your house and worship you. Heavenly Father, I pray that we are worthy of these things that we're about to partake of. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your Son, our Savior's uh, sacrifice on Calvary's cross. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that we all come together as one to worship you. And these things we pray in Jesus Christ's most heavenly and precious name. Amen. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. And welcome to the Lord's table. I don't always know what to say up here. I hope that I'm always led by the Holy Spirit. Last week I mentioned All Saints Day. I got ahead of myself. All Saints Day is November 1. I assumed we would uh, recognize it that first Sunday. And then the internet taught me this week, googling it, that most churches celebrate it, or many churches celebrate it on the Sunday after. So I'm going to say to you twice this year, happy All Saints Day. <laughs> All Saints Day is when we take pause to reflect and to know and to feel that all saints of the church, all of those that preceded us and the saints that we know and love dearly every week, and the saints that will come after us when we are gone, join us at this table today. It's a mystery. It sure is hard for me to prove it. But when I look upon these chairs, as I said in my Sunday school class this morning, I see Jean, I see my dad, I see Dorothy, I see all of these people, all of the saints of the church. Saints is a strong word, but it's a word that's used in the Bible to uh, name the members of the Christian community. So we join today in communion with all the saints of all the church, churches and all of the times. Jesus was coming close to the end of his ministry on earth. He desired to have close time personal time with those that he loved the most, his disciples. So arranging a quiet place, they gathered together. Jesus prayed with the disciples and I'm sure taught them many things of things that were to come. And toward the end of that meal, Jesus took from the table just simple bread. And breaking the bread, he said, this represents my body. My body is to be broken for you. Take it, eat. And likewise, Jesus prayed over the cup, saying, this cup represents my blood. My blood is to be shed for you, for the forgiveness of your sin, and for the sins of many others. Take it and drink.
may they be put to the use that will further your gospel and give praise to your name, dear Heavenly Father. We just ask that we use these in the right way to glorify you. In these things we pray in Jesus Christ's most heavenly and precious name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. In the book of Luke, the 13th chapter, I'll start with the 22nd verse. And Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house goes up and closes the door and will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, please open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, We ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there, gnashing of teeth, when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. But you yourselves thrown out. People will come from east and west, north and south, and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first, and first who will be last. Our choral anthem today, pretty simple one, very effective, amazing grace. that happened back in the 1500s 
Uh, in fact, I shared with folks earlier that I've got a page from a Bible that's back, uh, it's, I can't remember the exact date, but it's like 1560 or 1580, and my kids have got it for me one Christmas, and, and it's kind of a little treasure that I have there at my place, and it's in a, in a frame, and I just, just like it. Uh, uh, the Reformation became necessary. Uh, the church had, had, had uh, left a focus. They no longer had the scriptures as the primary authority. And uh, some of the things that they were doing, for example, uh, the church was that they were requiring people who were wanting to pray for those who died, they would have the parishioners bring them money and they would light a candle and they would pray for that person that they could go to heaven. They had a lot of different things that they were doing and they, uh, quite frankly, they accumulated a lot of money. And so there were people like John Calvin and I wish I could remember Zwingli's first name, but there were several guys, uh, John, uh, I said John Calvin, excuse me, Martin Luther. Uh, Martin Luther uh, was the one who really defied the Pope and uh, he put up on the, uh, the church uh, the 95 Theses, which is one of, one of them was concerning the fact that uh, we are justified by faith and by faith alone, not by the works of man. And uh, uh, of course that was, uh, you know, they put out death warrants for Martin Luther and so forth. But, the, but that, was the, that was kind of the key uh, teaching that uh, Martin Luther had. But what the issue was, was who had the authority? Was it the church and the pope or was it the scriptures? And that was the focus of the, uh, of, 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 the, uh, of the time that really caused a lot of challenge because quite frankly, there, the, the scriptures weren't out to the people. They didn't really want the people to be reading the scriptures. They did it themselves and of course they still even sometimes today uh, only have services in Latin and uh, a lot of people don't understand those words. But nonetheless, I have this incredible privilege of being able to read the scriptures and being able to just stare at them sometimes. And, and they are rather, um, they are rather uh, you know, searching. And that's what the Bible tends to do. It's, uh, it tends to search us. It tends to read us or read me, I should say. Um, there are things in the Bible that just sort of make me stop and think. Uh, for example, I want to be real in my faith. I want to be real on Monday, and I want to be real on Tuesday, and I want to be real on Saturday night. And I want to be real. I, I don't want to pretend in my faith. And one of the goals that Paul talks about in 1 Timothy chapter 1 he says that, uh, that, that the goal is that we would have a love from a pure heart. Can you imagine if you woke up every day and you really had that? <laughs> that you really loved from a pure heart. And then he says that you would have a good conscience. I want to have a clear conscience. And I find myself um, having to confess things that I thought or that I said or that I didn't say at the right time. So I, I find myself quite frequently asking for God to cleanse my conscience. And then he says that you would have a sincere faith. I want a faith that's real. I don't want one that's just said and, you know, this is, no, I want, I want a faith that, that's just real and it's just simply in Christ and it does, I'm not, it's not there to impress anybody. I just want, I want that fellowship. I want that more than I want anything else in life. I'm meeting with a couple of couples right now, um, and uh, a few, three couples, and, 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 I, and I told them one of the goals is, of course, is that one is that their marriages would be fantastic, <laughs> you know, quite frankly. Um, and so I get to share with them my own stuff and my own failures and all that, and I, I feel it necessary. 
And I want them to realize that one of the things as believers is that we want to we want to develop a strong faith, a strong faith that's willing to stand uh, with the with the with the strength to never turn back, to never turn back. Because we find, just like in this in the in the life of Jesus, we find that where Satan showed up. Now God had control over it, which is really interesting because the Bible actually says in John it says that Satan actually entered Judas's heart. Judas, uh, uh, Judas had been hanging out with Jesus for three years. Satan filled his heart, the Bible says, in John chapter 16. And you know what Jesus said? Uh, he said, uh, Judas, before he left, he gave him the sop. Remember, he promised. He said, whoever eats the sop with me will betray me. And he handed it to Judas. And Judas took off. But it says, Jesus says, Judas, what you must do, do it quickly. <laughs> he had absolute control. Chaos was about to take place. These religious people had come to take him by force. You see, these people were scared of others, and so they, they did it when nobody else was around. They did it at night. And one of the things that we find is that Jesus is trying to bring us all to is a place where we're willing to stand for him no matter what. No matter what. Because we want to come to a place where we love him supremely. Where we just, where we love him. Not the idea of him, but we've fallen in love with him. And that's really what we want to do, isn't it? Is where, where because 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says... It says, um, it says that he's invited us, or excuse me, he's called us to fellowship with his son. And I don't want by you, but I don't want anything less. I don't want anything less. I want this, I want to I wanna fellowship with him. I want to fellowship with Christ. When I, as I stand here, when I walk away, and when I go through my week, I just want to fellowship with him. And I have to tell you that that changes all my relationships. It does. It makes me uh, want to share this same information with anybody that would care to listen. And so there are really two thoughts. I'm going to give them to you, and then I'm going to give them to you again. But I'm going to go ahead and give them to you now, and then I'm going to give them to you again. And I'll be, I'll be through in plenty of time. But what I want us to see are, are two things. Like I told you, I've gotten down to two, and I'm trying to get down to one. I really do want to get down to one point. Um, uh, just because it's hard to remember a lot of stuff when you leave. Um, but you see, what, what's happened here is that, is that the religious people were so set on their tradition that the scriptures didn't have the authority. Their tradition was more important than the scriptures. And so once we lose, once we lose the, uh, the, 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 the scriptures have a primary influence on my thoughts, then, then it's difficult to distinguish between good and evil. You see, if, uh, if the scriptures are not coming into my life, then I really don't know often what exactly is right and what exactly is wrong. And so, therefore, we're going to notice in the passage where, where Jesus does emphasize what was written, what is fulfilled. And, 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 and so the scriptures become are, are the focus here. The second thing that I want us to know is this. Because the scriptures are fulfilled, we need to note that even... Uh, even though it seems like chaos is taking over here, um, we have this confidence in the scriptures that even though uh, the world might seem like it's falling apart, it's actually falling together. In Timothy, he tells us, um, he, he, he tells us in Timothy, uh, I'll give in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and chapter 4, I want to give this to you very quickly before I read this. 
In chapter 3, the first part, he talks about in the end days, it's going to be like this, you know. Men are going to be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And it starts going through a list of things of what the world is going to be like. And then he comes down to verse 16 and he says, that's in the first part of chapter 2 there. And then verse 16 it says um, that the scriptures are, are, are God-breathed. And they're given to us um, for correction and for instruction in righteousness. And then you go to the next chapter, what it says is that there are going to be those who are going to, uh, who are going to, uh, who are going to gather to, around themselves teachers who they want because they have itching ears to hear what they want to hear. It's a very dangerous thing to do. But see, so what we want to do, all of us in this room, I think everybody would agree with that, that all of us want to take the scriptures instead of me uh, uh, saying uh, whatever I want to say out of here, we, you and I can take the scriptures and allow God to speak to us and let him search us. You see? Let him search us. Um, and so we come to this, and, and, and just want you to understand that. Let's read this, beginning in verse uh, 43. Beginning in verse 43, I want you to notice this. I grabbed my water. Mm. I lost my top, so the top of this, so I had to. I got to be careful because I'm, I'm almost sure to knock it over. Chapter 14, notice verse 43. Um. He already told him that, that the, his betrayer was coming. Verse 43. And immediately, while they were still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with the great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now his betrayer had given him a signal saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one who sees him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him and said to him, Rabbi or teacher, Rabbi or teacher, and kissed him. Then they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest. And he cut off his ear. By the way, that was Peter. Verse 40, we find that in another book in Matthew. But verse 48, then Jesus answered and said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I was daily with you in the temple, teaching, and you did not seize me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then they all forsook him and fled. And I remember Jesus told them that they were going to leave. And they said, no, 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 no. We're going to stay and we'll even die for you. Well, he told them what was going to happen, and they did. And there's verse 51. Let's read this for fun. Uh, I don't know if this is fun or not. Verse 51. Now a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body. And the young man laid hold of him. And he left the linen cloth and fled from the naked. So let's think about that for a minute. What is that? Well, I can guess. I'm going to take a guess, and you can too. Um, it's probably Mark. Mark was not a disciple. He was not one of the disciples of 12, is what I want to say. He was a disciple, but he wasn't one of the 12. He was a, uh, you know, of course, he wrote the book uh, of Mark, right? Um, but nonetheless, he hung around Peter a lot, by the way. But nonetheless, um, it's probably him, because he, he just, you know, he said, oh, man, there was this guy, man. He was, you know, probably threw his clothes on and ran out there because he heard something going on, or he probably heard all those guys going out that way, and he took off to check it out. Oh, that was just that. Uh, that was free. You can, you can have your own idea on that. Um, but so the thoughts are that I, that I, that I want us to, to recognize is that without the scriptures, we really don't have the ability to discern what is right and wrong. Let me give you a, a passage. It's found in Hebrews chapter 4, and you can look at this at your convenience. You bring up that first point for me, Brent. I appreciate it. In Hebrews chapter 4, um, what we have is uh, where the scripture tells us that the word of God is powerful. It's powerful. And what it does, it discerns, um, it discerns between, uh, your, it, it discerns your thoughts and your motives. Scriptures just reveal that. Man. Just take the time. Read through Proverbs sometime. 
you know, just read through there, and, and it's beautiful because it gives you such insight into life and people, but insight to yourself as well. But nonetheless, um, uh, uh, what we what we find is is that he talks about that in chapter four. He says, he says, look, the the scriptures are 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 there to reveal things, and then you go to chapter five. Verses 11 and 14, and it says that the, you know, you know, that we get the milk of the word, and, and, and some of you guys are staying on milk, and you need to go to the meat of the word. You need to dig into this stuff. And he says, he says, what happens is when you do that, what occurs is that you're able to discern between good and evil. That's what it says. And so the Bible helps us, it strengthens us, and it teaches us. And God was very kind to give this to us. Because then we can discern, then we can discern, is it the Spirit of God that's leading us, or is it emotion? You see? You see? And so I want to, I see, I want this goal, you see, did you notice it? You know, here was Judas coming up. He was able to kiss him. You know how, for, you know how, how much? For 30 pieces of silver. Much. In fact, it was prophesied about that back in Zechariah chapter, I think chapter 11. It was prophesied about this, that in fact, Jesus was going to be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And you know what else it said about that 30 pieces of silver? It said that it was going to be used for a potter's field. You know what, you know what they did with it? God has control here. You know what, they, what happened was? Judas, he was so grieved, he came and he threw it at the, at the at, 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 I don't know that he threw it at them, but he threw it to them. The 30 pieces of silver, he felt so guilty. You know what he went and did? I can't imagine what it must have felt like. I cannot imagine. I cannot begin to imagine what it must have felt like to betray the Son of God. I can't imagine what must have come over him. Remember, Jesus says it had been better had he not been born. What he did was he went and he committed suicide because the guilt was so bad. He hung himself. Horrible. But it was prophesied about that. That that's what he was going to do. And you know what they did with the money? They bought a potter's field. Oh my goodness, are you serious? Yeah. It's prophesied probably about, about 700 years before. Read about it. Zechariah. I believe it's chapter 11. But nonetheless, um, so, so we le it leads us really kind of into this, this, this thought process. Then how does someone walk walk? Right. How do we do that? I mean, watch this. The first question I would have for myself is, Don, where does the desire to do what's right come from? Where does that come from? Uh, the Bible says the, the, the human heart is, is, is wicked and evil and who can know it? But where does it come from? Well, it comes from God. Let me, let, listen to this verse for a second. I'm going to watch my time. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, For it is God who works in you, watch this, both to desire and to do his good pleasure. What? Yeah. It's him that works in us. Isn't that great? I don't know about you, but I have a desire to do what's right, and it's not because I'm a good person. It's not because somehow I've gotten better than anybody, because I haven't. I'm on the same. We, we, we are all on the same plane. I might be the worst sinner in this place. Because I don't know you. I don't know what all goes in your heart. I only know what's in my heart. And all I know for sure is that he keeps, he keeps leading me in a different direction. And I like it. You see? And so how, okay, so, so who's doing that? Well, who's going to help me? What's going to be God that's going to help me? Because he uh, is God who works in you both to desire or to will and to do his good pleasure. Isn't that great? The work of God. And I want it. I want it all. In my life. And I hope you do too. Well, I could go on and on. Psalm 119, verse 9 and 11, it says, uh, How shall a young man keep his way pure? By taking heed according to your word. Uh, verse 11 then says, uh, It says, Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. I cannot think of a better thing for me to do during the week. And I'm, I'm going you know, to thank you guys right now because I get to look at the scriptures all week long. I I, I, uh, I get to study uh, all week long, all week long, every day I, I get to look at the scripture, the passage that I'm going to be talking to you about, I look at it every day. 
So I get this incredible benefit from that. Um, and so, again, I want a real faith. I want a, I want a, I want a, I want a pure love. I want a clean conscience. You see? That's what I want. That's what I want in my life. Well, the last point is this. Well, I have put myself in a corner here, but number two, if you'll bring that up, I, I, I'm telling you, I, you know I care about your time. I do. I think it's important. I don't like to go places and and and, and they take up all my time and I, they don't, only told me it was going to be this long. I, I'm good with it. The, the second point is this. So we have confidence found in the scriptures alone. <coughs> in the scriptures alone. That the world is is not falling apart, it's falling together. For example, the Bible says this, again in Timothy it says, uh, it talks about what the world is gonna be like. He talks about what it's gonna be like. He talks about, Jesus says things like this, it's gonna be like the days of Noah. Well, what's the days of Noah? The days of Noah, one was a, was a violent place. Number two, they, every man did what was right in their own eyes. Every man did what was right in their own eyes. You see? That's, that's, that's what it was like. The, the, the last days, he says, Paul says in Timothy, there's going to be deceivers. And just be careful. Listen, anybody here that wants to know the truth, John 7, 17 says this, anybody that wants to know the truth will know the truth. That simple. It is that simple. You want to know the truth? Then he's going to teach you the truth. No question about this. You know, I do want to look at just one, one final passage, but, but I, I just need to understand that everything about Jesus happened exactly as he said it was going to. Everything. I mean, that he was going to be betrayed, that he was going to, that he was going to be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Listen, it even says in Isaiah 53 that he was going to, uh, uh, that he, how he was going to die, or it shows the, what the experience he had in death. I want to read that, by the way. If you'll bring that passage up for me, uh, Brian, I, I'm doing good. In Isaiah 53, I just want to read a, a few of those verses out of there, out, out of Isaiah 53, because in Isaiah chapter 7, it says, Unto us a son is given, unto us a, us a son is born, and the government will be on his shoulders. What does that mean? It means that one day he's going to take authority. He's going to be the government. And then you go to chapter 9, and the Bible says, man, that, that, uh, that, 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 uh, that he is going to be called the everlasting father, the prince of peace, the mighty God, the, ever, the wonderful counselor. I mean, this is what it says of him. And uh, we go on and on. There are hundreds of verses. Why? Because he, look, nothing is surprising him right now. Nothing surprising him right now with what's going on in the world. And you and I have that confidence. Why? Because of the word of God. Look at look at this. Just so that, just because this is fun. I'm saying this is this is uh, uh, sobering and fun. Isaiah 53. Notice what it says. Here we're going to read it right there. This is a prophecy of his of his crucifixion. For goodness' sakes, 700 and some years prior. Read it. We're going to read this together. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we didn't esteem him. <coughs> it says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God. We saw God was getting rid of him and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes were healed. Remember, he got beaten with stripes. But watch this. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Watch this. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Is that, is that God's love or what? <laughs> we went away, but he, he put the iniquities of us on him. Notice what it says in verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Watch this now, beginning in verse 9. 
It says, and they made it, watch this, and they made his grave with the wicked. What does that mean? He died between two thieves. Watch this. But with the rich at his death. What does that mean? Joseph of Arimathea gave him his tomb. He was a rich man. Because he had, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Wow. Who could say that? Not me. Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Watch this. It, what? It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Why? He has put him, put, he has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin. He was the offering. He shall see his seed, which is you and I. He shall prolong his days. He came back from the dead. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Okay, so I want to close with this. <laughs> I want you to understand that, that the more you and I get to know him, the more you are going to be convinced that it was for you. The more that you get to know him, the more you spend time with him and talk to him and listen to him in his word. See, that's one of the griefs, one of the things that I grieve about is when I talk to believers and they're, they're, you can see it in their countenance. You can hear it in their words. They just feel like, I know, Don, I know that it's true. I just wonder about me. Well, see, that's the problem. When, you look, when I look at me, I'm not going to make it. But when I look at a God who died on the cross for my sins, <coughs> now it's all okay. Now it's all okay. By faith, we are justified in Him. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for these wonderful people. I know that you are the one who brought us here. Father, uh, may all of us in this room desire to walk with you on Monday and every day. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're going to sing together. God's spoken to you. Love to pray with you. Sit down. I want to make this my church home. We'll do that. Whatever the Lord spoke to you about, I'd love for you to do that. Would you stand with us, please? Wherever he leads, that's a, that's a big prayer right there. I'll go. Sharon, by the way, it's really good to see you this morning. I was going to introduce you to everybody, but, but we're glad you're here. If anyone wants to come with me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me.
that we will just continue on as a community of faith on the path that Christ has set before us. One of the things in our Constitution is, and I did this last week, is that uh, any amendments must be read to the congregation two Sundays in a row. So this is like deja vu, and I'm going to read it to you now. Number one, life is sacred, therefore we do not affirm abortion. Number two, race is sacred, therefore we do not affirm prejudice or discrimination in any form for any race of people because we were all created in God's image. Number three, marriage is sacred. Therefore, we can affirm marriage only between a man and a woman because this is original and his present design. I would add that uh, there's a handout on the front table there. Uh, Don has provided almost two pages of scriptural reference for this amendment. And I would encourage you to pick that up, study it, uh, whatever it helps you in, in any decision you might have to make. Anyway, that's the last time I'll read this to you, so thank you and have a good day. Thank you. Also, I just want to throw a plug in for Phyllis's dad, Tom Burkett, who will be 100 years old on November the 10th. Wow. Hundred years old. So I just wanted to mention that. Glad you were here. Certainly hope that you'll be back next Sunday, maybe even Wednesday night. We have a lot going on in the middle of the week, so hope that you can come be a part of that. If you would please dismiss us. Dear Father, we thank you this day. We thank you for the wonderful message and all of those that have gathered to worship this day. Allow us to at least gain and understand that we can. Move forward on faith and just faith alone in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Dismissed.